Okay. Yeah. Uh, good uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another exciting series of webinar. Uh, today we have Dr. Saurabh Mukhevar, who is currently a consultant gastroenterologist and interventional endoscopist at Midas Hospital, Nagpur. He is a young and dynamic physician. His academic interest includes advanced therapeutic endoscopy, including advanced ERCP and interventional EUS. Dr. Saurabh has completed his gastroenterology fellowship at Mayo Clinic, Rosher, and interventional uh, endoscopy fellowship at ULCA, UCLA uh, in, in USA. Dr. Saurabh ha has also worked as an interventional endoscopist and as a faculty at New York, uh, New York Revision, while Cornell Medical College, New York, before returning back to India. So, uh, Welcome, Dr. Saurabh. And his topic for today is uh, cholangioscopy and pancreatoscopy, interesting cases and newer applications. Uh, there is a couple of housekeeping announcements. If you have any questions, you can either uh, put it in the chat box or in Q&A. And Dr. Saurabh will be happy to answer after uh, at, at the end of his talk. Over to you, Dr. Saurabh. Okay. Hi, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, thank you so much for joining in. I'm uh, Saurabh Mukhevar and uh, thank you for the kind introduction. I'm a consultant gastroenterologist at Midas here in Nagpur. I'm also an adjunct assistant professor at Cornell in New York and uh, I was a faculty there for a year before I returned back to India last year. I, um, I'd like to thank the Boston scientific team for organizing this webinar. Um, they've been very professional and diligent and, uh, um, and it's great to work with you guys. Thank you so much. So we'll be talking about cholangioscopy, pancreatoscopy, uh, interesting cases and newer applications. Uh, uh, the field of uh, advanced in interventional endoscopy has really grown exponentially over the last 10 years. And there are several new advancements. We have obviously third space endoscopy has taken up. We have the hot axios, uh, which I've been using a lot, which are uh, for gallbladders and GJs, and of course for pancreatic collections. And, uh, and cholangioscopy and pancreatoscopy, which uh, has been there for a while, but now with the, the digital spy scope uh, and the ease of use, it has really uh, become extremely popular in the West and I'm sure in India as well now. And, uh, you know, overall, we are able to provide uh, a minimally invasive options to our patients and avoiding uh, morbidity and mortality with, uh, with surgical interventions that can happen sometimes. So. Um, I'd just like to share a, a case recently uh, as, as I start this presentation. Uh, uh, we just saw a patient with open CBD exploration for some bilirubin stones now, considering that, you know, the expertise with the RCP being available and definitely pancreatic cholangioscopy and lithotripsy. Uh, unfortunately, this patient developed a pretty bad bile leak, had a, a colonic fistula, and then uh, many ERCPs and eventually, thankfully he didn't die, but, but that just makes uh, us realize that, you know, if we do these, uh, if we offer these solutions to patients, we are really reducing the morbidity and mortality uh, for a lot of our patients. So it's exciting times to be in advanced endoscopy and let's talk about this today. All right. So ERCP is endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. As uh, you see here, as we know, it's a, it's a two-dimensional uh, technique where you, you know, you do basically you're treating under x-ray. And uh, most things we can manage, right? But then sometimes you need more help uh, when you have large stones as shown in the cholangiogram on the left. Or sometimes when you have to determine whether a stricture is malignant or not as this cholangiogram on the right. So in these patients, cholangioscopy can be a great tool. Uh, as you see here on the right, it's uh, beautiful images of the hilum and, and we can actually visualize inside the biliary uh, system uh, what's going on. So let's see what are the types of cholangioscopy. It's basically categorized as either direct or indirect. Direct would involve direct advancement of the ultra slim scope from your oral cavity inside the biliary ducts, okay, as shown here on the left. And we don't need a duodenoscope for this. Indirect would basically be either dual operator or single operator. So in this case, 
you use the duodenoscope to reach inside the duodenum. Then through the, uh, uh, the working channel of the duodenoscope, the cholangioscope is advanced. In the dual operator, there are two operators as shown in the picture here on the left. This is Dr. John Martin. He's, he was my uh, mentor at Mayo Clinic. And uh, uh, this has been, uh, this is dual operator. And then single operator, which is what's popular now and is basically taken off, is, uh, is where a single operator operates the duodenoscope as well as the cholangioscope. There are two available in market in India. One is the digital spyglass cholangioscope by Boston Scientific. And then you have the cholangioscope by Olympus. And this is what really is what we use today. Direct cholangioscopy has uh, great, there's uh, some advantages. I mean, you see the view here in the middle, it's just beautiful images. And uh, this is all with fiber optic. The problem is it's technically difficult. It requires a broad sphincterotomy, requires a dilated bile duct. You can't traverse narrow strictures. So those are several limitations with direct cholangioscopy. And uh, uh, this indirect cholangioscopy with two operators, we, it's termed as mother baby cholangioscope system. Uh, it's been around for a long time, almost uh, from the 1970s when it was first performed. It has never really taken off, largely because of several limitations. The, the quality of images uh, was inferior. Uh, there was no irrigation, limited working channel, deflection ability was limited. The cost is high because you need uh, two processors. You need two experienced endoscopists to perform the procedure. And the main problem was it was very fragile, so the scope would break. And uh, what now, which we, it's a single operator cholangioscopy, is uh, you have pretty good imaging. I, I wouldn't say it's as good as direct cholangioscopy, but it's pretty good. And that's definitely with DS2, which is what we use now, uh, it's really, really uh, improved significantly. Um, it's pretty easy to use. I'm, I've probably trained in the generation where you only have these, but my understanding is it's definitely easier than uh, the earlier generation ones. And uh, it's plug and play. So you just, it's a very simple device and uh, it's just plugged in and you advance it through the duodenoscope. For any of you interested in this topic and want to read further, this is a recent review article in gastrointestinal endoscopy clinics of North America, which uh, discusses cholangioscopy, and several other advancements in Wheeler imaging, endomicroscopy, OCT, Zydus, et cetera. So uh, if you don't have access to this, I'm happy to share it with you. I'll share my email at the end, and uh, you know, I'm happy to send you the PDF version. All right. So let me go through some interesting cases that we have managed recently. This is the first case is a nine-year-old male was referred for evaluation of abnormal LFTs and a common bile duct stricture. He had undergone open cholecystectomy at age of five for chronic cholecystitis. Labs showed some mild anemia, uh, microcytic, leukocytosis, thrombocytosis, and the eosinophil count was high to 16%. Bilirubin was up to 2.1, mild elevation in LFTs. IgE levels were very high, above 5,000. Testing for parasites was negative. MRCP showed a stricture in the common bile duct. And this patient was actually going to undergo a hepatic jejunostomy. Uh, the surgeon uh, still wanted a second opinion, so decided to uh, refer the patient and we decided to go ahead and do uh, cholangioscopy to further evaluate this. So we start with uh, biliary cannulation, standard technique with a sphincterotome over a 0.035 inch guide wire. And uh, phalangiogram here shows a stricture in CBD. And uh, we go ahead with a biliary sphincterotomy. And then the cholangioscope is advanced into the common bile duct. Um, I'll share with you some tips a little later. But basically what I like to do is I, I advance the scope um, to the hilum and then I, I pull back gradually. Uh, to ensure I adequately visualize the uh, biliary mucosa. All right, so this is the cholangioscopic view inside the bile duct. I'll just move forward a little bit. So right here, well, that's from contrast and I'd advise not to put a lot of contrast before. 
Uh, now you see as I'm pulling back, that was the cystic duct opening on the right. Oh, actually, put it down. Right there. And right here is the stricture. Now, if you notice, the lining is uh, irregular. It's, it's almost granular in appearance. There's edema, it's swollen. There is a mild edema with some few blood vessels here. Okay, a few more views. All right. So we ended up uh, taking biopsies from the stricture. Uh, normally I would do spy bites, this patient couldn't afford, so we ended up uh, doing uh, wire guided biliary biopsies and placed a stent in the CBD. This uh, histopathology showed eosinophilic cholangitis. And as you see over here on the left, this is a section from the bile duct. Uh, there's a lot of inflammation with eosinophils here. There's some sections from duodenum as well, which actually showed some, uh, some bile duct, uh, some uh, eosinophils right there. Um, patient was started on oral steroids. Four weeks later, clinical improvement with no pain and normalization of LFTs. So eosinophilic cholangitis, it's a rare cause of biliary strictures. Um, I could only find over 40 odd cases reported in literature. Patients present with abdominal pain, jaundice, the mean age is 39 years. Most of the patients will have peripheral eosinophilia. Surgery, hepaticojejunostomy is done. And uh, I think it's largely from surgical series because they didn't know preoperatively. Uh, this was a benign condition and uh, patients have been treated with steroids effectively. Uh, I think uh, given lack of the number of cases, we don't know what maintenance medications may work. And uh, we'll see in our patient what we can find. All right. So when we look at strictures, uh, on the other end of the spectrum would be a malignant stricture. And I'll just show you a case in which uh, will show findings of malignancy. In this case, you see it has a, a nodular appearance and uh, there's some inflammation. You see these almost villous appearance with some blood vessels, neovascularization. And we obtain uh, biopsies directly under visualization with spy bite forceps. This is a preferred method if we can. And uh, this would be an illustration of a malignant structure. This patient had cholangiocarcinoma. In terms of appearance, uh, this meta-analysis showed 60% uh, sensitivity of cholangioscopic appearance for detection of malignancy. Uh, this is, again, back in 2015. Uh, there have been advancements in imaging since then. The issue is uh, there are no clear-cut criteria which will say, based on appearance, that this is malignant or that's benign. So, this is a recent study with some of my mentors uh, from New York and uh, basically 12 experts reviewed 40 videos of cholangioscopy and uh, they basically characterize uh, each stricture on, in various findings, ulceration scars, papillary projections and, and etc. So ulceration was seen more frequently with malignant strictures versus benign. Papillary projections seen more frequently with malignant versus benign. But again, you see 55% versus 23%. So it's not absolute. And then uh, some sort of a lesion, they didn't really clearly mention what the lesion meant. But again, seen more frequently with malignant uh, strictures. The problem is, again, you can't find absolute characteristics which will say it's malignant or benign, but certain clear cut appearances can sway you one way or the other. But the issue is that the kappa coefficient, if you see the inter-observer agreement was really low. I mean, slight for most of these features, fair. It's only for papillary projections, it was 0.43. So while appearance helps, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's not perfect. Let me put it that way. If you add bi uh, biopsies with spy bites, the sensitivity can go up to 84% in this meta-analysis. And then uh, most recently, this is a large multi-center study on cholangioscopy for indeterminate biliary structures, 290 cases. Uh, this was uh, 
also contributed with our colleagues at AIG in Hyderabad, um, where basically the sensitivity of visualization for malignancy was 86%. Spy bites was actually a little lower, 75%. So overall accuracy of 77% uh, of visualization, 86% with addition of spy bites. Again, the new randomized controlled trial, just hot off the press. This is also with our colleagues at AIG and other centers. Brushings were compared with cholangioscopy biopsy for indeterminate stricture. Basically, regular brushings, the sensitivity was only 21% versus cholangioscopy, the sensitivity was 68% for detecting malignant strictures. Specificity was both 100% in both. So overall, bites with cholangioscopy appear to be more preferred compared to just brushings. All right, so let me share with all of you some tips uh, with cholangioscopy. First, I think it's important that you get a good sphincterotomy. Definitely, uh, now if you have to, you have to understand that you're advancing a 10 French instrument inside the bite duct. So a good sphincterotomy is always uh, beneficial. I'd say advance the cholangioscope or a guide wire definitely for beginners. Uh, I've done it both freehand and guide wire. The issue is I've heard of people perforate with freehand techniques. So therefore uh, the safer bet is to use it over a guide wire when you are advancing it in the body duct. Positioning, uh, you can do it in supine positions for those who do ERCP. In my experience, the scope tends to fall off more easily when you do it in a supine position. So I prefer to have a semi-prone position when you can. If you can't advance the cholangioscope and you have difficulty, just go in a long position, try to get a straight angle to the bile duct and uh, you should be able to get in. Limit your contrast use before, or even if you do, just take it out because that'll cause hazy appearance and you know, just prolong your duration of procedure unnecessarily. Generously flush with normal saline. Uh, definitely for stones. For strictures, yes, there is a risk of cholangitis. So you can, I've been a little gingerly, but uh, for stones, yeah, just generously flush with uh, NS while you're visualizing. Have your dials in a semi-lock position. So if you lock the dials, you're pushing and potentially cause more harm. Unlocked dials, you'll have trouble seeing. So semi-lock in the midway position is, is the most preferred position. But of course, you may have to unlock your dials uh, as in, when you need to. Uh, when you do lithotripsy, as you would have learned, you have to be about half a millimeter away from the targeted uh, stone. You don't have to actually contact the stone. And lastly, what we mostly encounter is difficulty advancing accessories. And uh, it's such a painful exercise because uh, the things that you need to remember, if your dials are locked, you need to unlock. There could be a kink in your cholangioscope. You may have to straighten it out. The elevator is oftentimes the place where the, the accessories won't go through. So you may have to relax the elevator. Sometimes you've had, I've had to just pull the scope back inside the duodenoscope channel, get this accessory to the tip, and then advance it back into the bile duct. So these are some of the issues that you may encounter. So we've uh, done studies in the past looking at insufflation with carbon dioxide, and uh, that's can be an alternative where uh, we did this on four pigs where CO2 was insufflated with no bile duct rupture or instability in vital signs or hepatic or biliary barotrauma on necropsy when we use CO2, uh, which can be an alternative and uh, uh, for, for visualization. All right, let's move on. Uh, look at case number two here. This is a 61 year old male with hypertension, coronary artery disease. Uh, underwent PTCA in the past, cabbage in 2016, congestive heart failure with ejection fraction of 30%, prior cholecystectomy in 2018. He presented with a three-day history of acute abdominal pain and vomiting. Vitals showed mild tachycardia, but otherwise stable. Labs showed uh, leukocytosis with a white count of 11,800, transient uh, slight elevation in LFTs, the lipase was up to 2700, so this was consistent with acute pancreatitis. MRI, uh, MRCP showed uh, 
this remnant gallbladder with a stone which is identified and a long cystic duct as you see here there's a low insertion of cystic duct and it's pretty long right here we discussed management options uh, surgical resection uh, considering his multiple comorbidities it was felt to be high risk uh, we offered him ERCP with uh, digital spyglass colangioscopy and removal of stone from the remnant gallbladder which is what he ended up choosing so here we uh, cannulated the bile duct routine method with a sphincterotome or a guide wire again we did a generous sphincterotomy as i mentioned going right to the edge Colangiogram showed the cystic duct insertion on the lower end right here. Otherwise, there's nothing in the bile duct. We advanced the cholangioscope over the guide wire into the cystic duct. And uh, right here, uh, this was one of our earlier videos where audiovisual systems were not in place. So uh, bear with me on this video. Uh, the cholangioscope is inside the cystic duct here. And uh, what we see are the uh, spiral valves of Heister, uh, which are preventing passage of the cholangioscope inside right here so i was about to sort of give up but then i we did a, a injected some contrast as you see a fairly long narrow cystic duct so i decided to proceed with dilation use a biliary balloon six millimeters to dilate the entire cystic duct and then I eventually could advance the uh, the cholangioscope into the gallbladder remnant over here as you see and uh, well, and then we find the stone lodged right, right there. So then we decided to retrieve it with uh, the new tool here. This is the spy basket, which goes through your cholangioscope. Uh, right here, we are advancing it. And then uh, after a few attempts, we managed to grab the stone. And then with uh, sort of gentle manipulation, we pulled it out of the cystic duct stump. And just uh, move forward a little bit here. And then we retrieved it uh, right here, as you see on the duodenoscope view, the stone through the uh, cholangioscope. Okay. Cholangiogram was fine and uh, patient had no adverse events. Uh, patient was discharged in two days, no recurrence of pancreatitis at follow up in six weeks. So I've done this before and uh, this is a video GI case where uh, a patient had cystic duct remnant syndrome with a stone with inflammation and symptoms. We ended up doing lithotripsy and uh, broke the stones down and retrieved it. Uh, well, I'm not the only one who's removed stones from the gallbladder. This is a series from China where uh, they removed uh, with a success rate of 100% stones from the gallbladder using a cholangioscope. It's quite interesting. They actually used a covered metal stent to get access to the gallbladder and then with the cholangioscope and tools removed uh, the gallstones. I think uh, this could play a role in patients where you can't do EUS gallbladder drainage with axios. So if you uh, save decom cirrhosis patients with, um, uh, who are potentially going to undergo liver transplant, where you don't want to alter the anatomy and place any trans duodenal or gastric uh, or axios, then this could be a viable option where you go inside and actually retrieve these stones and, uh, and maintain the anatomy and the patients can actually get transplant and they have high risk of surgery here. All right, I'll share with you some of the interesting cases. Uh, this is a patient with 73 year old female with jaundice and chills and the MRI showed uh, a, this intrahepatic duct packed with stones. So we get the cholangioscope all the way up to the hilum. I'm just gonna move forward. So as we explore, Right here, this is, uh, so this was the, the duct, which is where you see it's gonna be packed with stones. Problem is, of course, when you're all the way up right there, it was hard to get this cholangioscope advanced directly inside the duct. Uh, I decided to opt for uh, 
advancing a guide wire in the system here. I'll show you in a second. So we've got the guide wire up there and then uh, we basically advance the scope over the guide wire. And then uh, performed laser lithotripsy. This took me about an hour and a half or so. And uh, basically in a couple of settings, we could uh, effectively remove all the stones from his intrahepatic duct, from her intrahepatic intra duct rather. And now, I mean, we've basically avoided a major surgery in this patient with so many, uh, you know, which was otherwise would have been high risk given her age and had some other comorbidities. All right. This is another exciting study. This is from 2018 from the Stanford group. Basically, what they did was uh, for regular CBD stones, they performed radiation free ERCP with the help of cholangioscopy. So cannulation was performed with a sphincterotome or a guide wire. They aspirated to ensure they're in the bile duct as bile was uh, aspirated. They performed a biliary sphincterotomy, then performed cholangioscopy, noted the stones in the bile duct, identified the distance from the ampulla, then usually with the routine balloon sweeps, removed the stones, repeated cholangioscopy to confirm clearance. And if there are any stones, this was repeated. Bottom line, they were 100% successful in removal of the stones. The duration wasn't too bad, 34 minutes. 5% uh, did require some brief radiation. Adverse events were not more than your routine ERCP. Now this can be a great alternative for pregnant patients whom you don't want to expose them to radiation. Um, all right, some other interesting cases. This is a patient, 67-year-old uh, male with history of uh, liver transplant, had hepatic artery thrombosis, biliary cast syndrome with pylomas and jaundice. Uh, so as you see on the MRI here, there are a lot of uh, biliary casts right there. So you get the cholangioscope. I'm going to move forward. Yeah, and right here inside the biloma, you see all the biliary uh, casts over here. And uh, with the help of uh, spy bites, forceps, we manually basically all right, I'll show you in a second. So with, yeah, so we manually actually removed uh, all the biliary casts successfully and uh, avoided a surgery here. All right, I'm gonna move forward here. This is another patient with liver abscess. Uh, anyway, the other cases where it can be helpful is placement of guide wires across tight structures. Um, with the advent of liver transplant and so many more cases being performed in India, you can expect to have some severe strictures following transplant at the anastomosis. Uh, these patients uh, can have really big dilated uh, bile ducts and if you can't get a guide wire in this series, the use cholangioscopy had a 60% success rate in placement of a guide wire across the strictures. Another series here, uh, overall 70% success for benign strictures, 88%, and then for malignant strictures, 46%. So overall, this can be a good alternative for, excuse me, tight strictures. Uh, biliary polyps, sometimes you can encounter these, it's there. Uh, you can use the new spy snares for uh, resection, as uh, shown in this report here. Stent retrievals, yeah, migrated stents can be a nightmare. Uh, again, you can use spy uh, snare to retrieve the stent. Okay, so let's talk about uh, another case here. This is a 38 year old male with no significant past history presented with chronic abdominal pain. Labs uh, were largely unremarkable, mild elevation and lipase to 96. A CT of the abdomen showed uh, a dilated main pancreatic duct. And as you see here, a stone resulting in obstruction of the uh, pancreatic duct. So we did an ERCP initial attempt at cannulation through the major papilla was, uh, was actually not successful. We switched to the minor papilla and uh, it's prominent. We cannulated with a sphincterotome or a guide wire. Pancreatogram now showed a stone in the head of pancreas. Uh, 
with a diffusely dilated uh, main pancreatic duct. So we did uh, minor papillotomy and uh, then did papilloplasty with the balloon. And then I decided to place uh, three stents here. I've placed two 10 French and one seven French stent to really expand the, uh, the, the main uh, the, the pancreatic duct. And we discussed options for the patient. Um, we explored surgery or uh, pancreatoscopy and laser lithotripsy with stone removal. We, at our institutions, we don't have ESWL, so we offered pancreatoscopy. And uh, we opted for pancreatoscopy. We removed the stents in the next setting. Did papilloplasty again. This was about, I think, eight millimeters. And then advanced the scope, the pancreatoscope. Uh, gradually over the wire, we advanced it right there. And uh, inside the pancreatic duct here, you see the mucosa is inflamed, strictured. You see a stone lodged in the middle. And then we decided to perform laser lithotripsy. We used generally uh, about 10 to uh, 15 watts power, up to two joules of energy. And then sequentially the stone was broken down. And then it's getting smaller. So this took about I'd say an hour or so. And uh, eventually the stones were removed with the help of basket. Uh, just as a word of caution, try to use uh, baskets and pancreatic stones. The balloons can burst with because these stones are very sharp compared to biliary stones. All right. Post procedure pancreatogram showed a duct which is completely clear of the stones. And uh, no adverse events from the procedure. I placed some PD stents, which I removed later. And on uh, follow-up, he had complete resolution of symptoms. The patient was discharged home the following day. Four weeks later, he remained asymptomatic. All right, so let's look at some data on uh, pancreatoscopy and lithotripsy in chronic pancreatitis. So this is a, a, a compilation of uh, multiple series, right from nine years, uh, 1999 to 2017. Spyglass DS was used in the more recent series and overall the 80 to 100 percent success rate was uh, achieved using uh, pancreatoscopy and lithotripsy. Well uh, in the West IPMN is, is, is frequently encountered. I'd say it's a, it's a relatively less known entity in India and I think I just want to highlight uh, some interesting cases here. Now, this is an 81-year-old male, non-alcoholic, non-smoker, presented with weight loss, diarrhea, anemia. Now, you look at the CT on the left, multiple calcifications throughout pancreas. The, the bile duct is, sorry, the pancreatic duct is dilated. And most of us uh, would call it chronic pancreatitis, right? I mean, you look at the EUS, it's dilated duct right here. You have shadowing. Turns out this patient had IPMN and the main duct IPMN variety. Uh, this is a series of such patients. This is uh, from my from Mayo Clinic where I trained, and this was by my mentor, Dr. Suresh Chari. Patients uh, had calcifying obstructive pancreatitis secondary to main duct IPMN, which actually tends to happen because of the mucin produced by the main duct IPMN, which over time leads to uh, pancreatic duct obstruction formation of uh, calcium stones and deposits, and uh, basically it's uh, chronic pancreatitis now, but it's secondary to IPMN. So it's important that you recognize this entity because these patients obviously have a much higher risk of pancreatic cancer. Now, if you look at the data in this, uh, calcification was seen in the main and side branches in virtually all these patients. The tip off was uh, really because they saw mucin or basically uh, fish mouth appearance at the ampulla in these patients. So I'm sure there are a lot of patients out there with uh, chronic pancreatitis suspected, but turns out they have IPMN. And I, uh, this is from my personal experience from cases. 
several patients with IPMN have calcification. So don't discount the presence of IPMN in these chronic pancreatitis patients. So just to highlight a, a case here, a 47 year old female with abdominal pain, MRCP showed a dilated pancreatic duct. Uh, pancreatoscopy is performed and uh, well, right here, So over a guide wire, we advanced the pancreatoscope inside the main pancreatic duct. And see, you'll see some beautiful appearance right here. Now this is, um, well now this is basically uh, main duct IPMN and you see these papillary projections and uh, what we classically term as uh, fish mouth, uh, or sorry, fish eggs and uh, there are some villous projections as you see over here in a, in, a, in a second right there. All these torches, long blood vessels. We obtained uh, biopsies from the site right there. All right. This is a series uh, of 40 IPM in patients with pancreatoscopy. And basically what this, this is out of Japan and they basically characterize the IPMN in five categories, right from a basic granular variety to fish eggs, fish eggs with blood vessels, the villus changes right here are vegetative with a formation of a mass. The cancer risk was 0% in those with fish eggs. And then with these morphologies, the cancer risk was excessively high in the range of 90% or so. so uh, pancreatoscopy can definitely be of benefit in these patients now. All right. So this is another interesting recent study. Excuse me. Well, this is another interesting study by my colleagues in New York. Basically, 118 patients underwent uh, cholangioscopy or pancreatoscopy for pancreatobiliary neoplasia. Bottom line, there was a change in the surgical plan in 34%. That's 39 patients had a change in surgical plan. For pancreatic surgery, this is 62%. Eight out of 13, there was a change in plan. So four had less extensive surgery. Four had more extensive surgery. For biliary surgery, this was about 30%. 5% had less extensive surgery. In 25%, they avoided surgery because they were non approval All right, let's move on. Uh, this is another interesting case. 56-year-old female with uh, alcoholic cirrhosis, chronic pancreatitis, new stricture at the genio pancreas, had EUS, which is negative. This patient underwent pancreatoscopy and sampling of the stricture. The pleural image, the pancreatoscope now is being advanced. And right here is the... Uh, is the stricture. I mean, as you see, based on the appearance, it's, uh, it's clear that's probably a benign stricture because of uh, scarring that you see, this whitish appearance. And we, we obtained direct biopsies from the stricture site. All right. This ended up being a benign stricture from chronic pancreatitis. Okay. This is uh, out of the Colorado group who have uh, been doing pancreatoscopy for a long time. And uh, this is for strictures in the pancreatic duct. Now, they included here 79 patients with indeterminate strictures. These patients had negative EUS sampling in 80% of the cases. 97% technical success rate, only one patient actually could not perform this procedure. And uh, you see the 33 patients had uh, pancreatic neoplasia with uh, 12 cancer patients and 21 patients with main duct IPMN. In this series, they've tried to find characteristics which would be associated with cancer based on appearance, presence of tumor vessels, which are large, broad vessels with ulcerations, friability, and an infiltrative structure, uh, stricture was suggestive of an adenocarcinoma. If you had protrusions, papillary finger-like projections would suggest a main duct IPMN. And then if you have granularity, band-like scarring, that would go in favor 
of a benign structure. Now, based on appearance itself, with the visual impression, they were 87% sensitive in detecting malignancy, and a, com a combination was 91% successful. All right, just to summarize everything today, for biliary indications, stones. Now, clearly for large CBD stones, all of us probably are aware of use of uh, cholangioscopy and lithotripsy. I would suggest that if you have a distal duct which is narrow or your routine methods fail. Intrahepatic stones definitely have had good success with cholangioscopy and lithotripsy. Unusual stone locations, I, I showed you the case with remnant gallbladder stone or cystic duct stump where you can use it. Uh, for stone clearance, uh, 10 to 20 percent stones are missed on cholangiogram and uh, this has happened to me before. Patients had a negative cholangiogram, ended up having pancreatitis. Uh, so I think uh, it's, uh, it may play a role, of course, cost is a major factor in Indian context, but uh, this can be useful. Indeterminate structures, I think there is enough evidence to support use of cholangioscopy and biopsies over brushings. Uh, it's definitely more superior. For malignant structure, it's one study which showed uh, that it can guide the extent of malignancy and guide in resection margins. Biliary polyps, yes, if you can avoid a major surgery, why not? Migrated stents again. Guide wire placement in tight structures. Sometimes you need cystic duct access and you can't get it. Uh, this can be a good alternative. Uh, uh, it's a good tool to have. Next, let's look at pancreatic indications uh, for stones. We don't know, there are no head-to-head -head comparisons with ESWL. I'd say there's a role for both. Uh, if ESWL doesn't work, there's maybe a couple of stones, then uh, pancreatoscopy and laser lithotripsy can be a good option. For indeterminate strictures with negative EUS sampling and you're concerned that this chronic pain patient has developed cancer, and if you can get the 10 French uh, scope at the site, then I think uh, it's reasonable to try pancreatoscopy. And then in main duct IPMN, if you want to differentiate from chronic pancreatitis, as I showed you in those earlier cases, uh, also I, I definitely use it for extent of malignancy and definitely pre-op. Uh, as a matter of fact, we do have a, a case which we are going to use this now. So let's see well, how much it helps. All right, so thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, I, I keep up up uploading uh, New things at uh, Midas Hospital at Facebook and uh, we also have our YouTube channel coming up soon. So uh, thanks again for joining in. Please follow us. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer via email certainly today. And uh, if you want any of these articles, I'm happy to share them with you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, sir. What an amazing presentation and variety of cases which we have seen. I mean, everybody is spellbound. Yeah, definitely there are many questions, not few. So I will take one by one, sir. Yes. So uh, first question uh, is, I had uh, recently a case of chronic caloric pancreatitis with 8 mg size PD with stricture in PD in head region. We don't have ESWL and cholangioscopy. I did EPT and CRE followed by removal of stone. It was very tough removing it. Is there any trick of trade in such cases? See, I think, uh, all right. So in your case, uh, if I understand correctly, the PD is eight millimeters and a stone is fixed. You had to do EPB, well, endoscopic dilation of the pancreatic duct and then you retrieve it, right? Is, is that, am I understanding correctly? Yeah. So right. can you come, come again? No, no, I, okay. I, I think I got it. So, so the first thing is uh, you can be generous with your balloon dilation. I uh, did go up to eight millimeters through the minor duct in my case. And I, what I did was uh, I basically put big, big stents. 10 French PD stents are obviously not available if I'm not mistaken. So uh, we created with side holes, a regular BLA 10 French stent. And I put two of those and a seven French stand through the PD, uh, through the minor or orifice in my case. Now that's something you could do. Have a 10 French stand, make holes, uh, just load it, like try to put as many as you can. Of course, be careful. You don't want to perforate. Uh, but what it does is it'll, it'll stretch your pancreatic duct. Give it some time, give it three to four weeks, let it stretch. 
then take out the stents and that point you you know whatever area of narrowing is there is probably uh, expanded in terms of removal of the stone uh don't use balloons use baskets number one uh secondly what i would suggest is uh if you can't like see ultimately pancreatoscopy and lithotripsy is only breaking your stone down right i mean you're not doing anything more than that so if you can get your mechanical lithotripsy basket in and actually crush the stone i have never done it before i don't know if your biliary balloon baskets are going to break for pd hard stones but i guess that's worth a shot if it's big and you have to break it down and uh, then you can you know do your regular basket maneuvers to retrieve it it's going to be hard you may have to you know uh, i think it's a lot of skill at that point and uh, it's hard to translate skill in words but uh, that's what i would do you know this routine stuff uh, but those are the things i would do yeah yeah thank you sir the second question is from dr ankit patel Yeah. in this uh, uh, in the first case of eosinophilic cholangitis ercp with biopsy is not sufficient instead of cholangiography in cholangiography sensitivity of a visualization is more than hp why is it so see uh, in cholangiography what you are referring to with a higher sensitivity of appearance was based on uh, malignant strictures right that's what we saw in that large series of 290 patients now see sometimes you can have a malignant stricture which is the infiltrative variety so you do your regular biopsy that may not pick up even if you go ahead and use your spy bites uh, so if that's the infiltrative variety you may not be able to get adequate bites from the uh, site now the other issue is how many spy bites do you get right see i am of a, i'm a big believer in making sure that you give enough you know get enough bites uh, some people who take just like one or two bites and leave it at that now that's may not be enough right because uh, we've known in various other gi conditions that your yield of diagnosing absolutely goes up when you get more bites so do not be miser in terms of the number of bites i personally take anywhere from 4 to 8 bites until i'm really satisfied i look at the sample and i know that it's not going to be uh, negative i'm not going to give up and if you look at that series a uh, lot of uh, cholangiographies they did only one bite or so maybe two so it's a personal preference i like to do more than four uh, maybe four to eight somewhere in that ballpark range now as far as the sensitivity for uh, the benign stricture goes uh, i'm not sure because uh, again for benign strictures the fact that you get a biopsy appearance is negative biopsies are negative then i guess it's benign in that case right i mean unless you follow up and it turns malignant thank you sir uh, the next question is from dr bhushan uh, is it safer to use cholangiography for retrie- uh, retrieval of stones in setting of acute uh, biliary pancreatitis see in the setting of acute biliary pancreatitis if you have large stones which need to be retrieved and i don't think there's any issue in terms of performing cholangiography itself in the uh, in the bile duct when you have pancreatitis again comes down to the urgency and the need right what we know is the only benefit of emergency ercp in acute biliary pancreatitis is in patients with cholangitis it's only in those patients that you have mortality benefit in the 24 hours after uh, with who have cholangitis and pancreatitis otherwise there is no benefit of doing an urgent ercp in these patients you can let it resolve give it four days let the pancreas cool down let the papilla relax and cannulate nicely after that get inside the bile duct to remove them so as far as the cholangiography goes yeah i mean of course if it's not emergent i mean you can always place a stent and come back at a later date and address uh, the, all the stones and remove them yeah thank you sir uh, there is a question from dr trunal can cholangiography be used for altered anatomy patients yes actually i have used it myself so the cholangiography length uh, is adequate I, i'm not sure what the exact length what we have i mean the boss you guys can com- uh, opine on the on what's the length of the cholangiography but obviously you have the whole duodenoscope 
And then you have all the additional length of the cholangioscope. So I have personally used it in altered anatomy patients. Actually, uh, this is during my training. There's a patient who had cholangiocarcinoma, underwent uh, hepatic OJ, and basically we used an adult colon scope to reach the hepatic OJ because this guy came with jaundice, uh, you know, on follow-up two years later. So we did a, a ERCP with a, uh, with a colon scope to the hepatic OJ. And uh, then we performed cholangioscopy inside the, uh, across the hepatic OJ. And, uh, we, you know, there was evident malignancy and we got direct bites and uh, the patient had cancer. So yes, it can be done. It's just a matter of length. And if you're using a double balloon scope, I, I'm not sure, I have not done it before. The first issue is the, the you know, cholangioscope is 10 French. So I'm not sure if double balloon scopes will permit a 10 French uh, catheter to go across. So now that's your hurdle. So if you can reach the altered anatomy biliary hepatico J site with an adult colon scope, yes, you can do cholangioscopy. So what is your take on role of spy uh, cholangioscopy in synergy with EUS? In synergy with EUS. So I highlighted a few things here. It's based on the indication. Now, if there's a dominant stricture in a patient uh, where you have done EUS and your FNA or FNB is negative for a, say a PD stricture, then yeah, I mean, that, that series shows uh, that and pancreatoscopy and biopsy can be of benefit, right? So that's one. Now, as far as the EUS for biliary system goes, uh, of course, if you're doing it largely for sampling, you know, I, as far as say, uh, if you're talking about a cholangiocarcinoma, a series out of Mayo Clinic uh, showed basically from some of my early, previous colleagues uh, that when you go with an EUS needle across the duodenal wall and say, you know, you do FNA, FNB of the hyalur cholangio, okay? If it is resectable, you are putting this patient at risk of needle tract seeding in the duodenal wall. Now, duodenal wall probably is not going to be in your operative field, right? So if you have a hyalur cholangio and you're not going to resect the duodenum, you're just going to do hepatic OJ, then you are potentially putting this patient at risk of uh, recurrence in future. So in higher cases, my advice would be prefer uh, cholangioscopy and biopsies in a resectable case. If it's unresectable, then it's fine. Then you can go ahead with EUS because regardless, you can cause needle tract seeding, doesn't matter. Patient is not operable, it's not a problem. But if it's operable, I would not advise, and as a routine practice at Midas and before at my institutions, we never did US biopsies in these patients. Right. Uh, there's one more question from uh, uh, Dr. Ankit Patel. Uh, sir, in uh, intrahepatic stones, up to what level cholangioscope can enter? I have, you know, gone into the second BD radicals. Uh, you know, in this particular case I showed you. Uh, it was one of the branches of, I, I'm not sure if it was right anterior, posterior, one of the ducts. So second biliary radicals, it just is limited by size. Your cholangioscope is 10 French. So the duct has to be more than 10 French. That's more than three millimeters bottom line, right? So it's the length and the size. If your length cholangioscope can go in, it's three millimeters or more. You should be able to advance it. Of course, there is a technical challenge because naturally you're going through you know, uh, there's always curves and bends and, uh, and if you can accomplish to get it in. So I had to use a, a guide wire. In fact, uh, cholangioscope went in and the second time it was really hard to get a regular seven French stent as well into the bile duct. So it can, can get challenging, yeah. Uh, so there's one more question. Uh, your experience on EHN and Holmium laser, are they equally effective? What's your take? All right, so when I trained, I use DHL and then as faculty, I've been using laser. So I have not found a huge difference between the two. Uh, laser, I think was marginally better, again, subjective impressions in the bile duct. 
in the pancreatic duct, I'd say uh, from based on my interaction with some of the Boston team, they felt EHL may be a little better because there's no head-to-head -head comparison and uh, no, there's no evidence or science behind it. But maybe EHL may be preferable in pancreatic duct. I've used laser without any issues. Uh, but that's basically it. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, there is a one compliment from Dr. Uh, Abraham. Uh, it's a very nice presentation. Uh, one more question from Dr. Trunel uh, on the durability of SpyScope. Is the spyglass is reusable? If yes, uh, what's your experience on it? How many times? Yeah. See, I think uh, spyscopes are not meant to be reusable to begin with. Uh, uh, you know, they are disposable single-use equipments. Uh, in an Indian context, with cost being such a major consideration, uh, of course, it's been successfully reused, and I have done it myself here. Uh, you can uh, use it up to, on an average, five times. It sort of depends on how much you have uh, uh, really damaged the scope and uh, if there are kinks. Now, uh, five is probably the average quoted based on my interactions with the Boston team. Uh, you have to be careful. You have to be gentle. You have to make sure you don't bend it too much and, you know, uh, use it as much as you need to. Uh, if you're using it, say, for a short case, you know, you did, just did cholangoscopy, you got four bites and came out. Fine. And you use it for a lithotripsy case and you're going back and forth then you know, wear and tear is a lot more. So uh, there's no set number naturally, but you have to be careful. You have to make sure you don't bend it too much because the main problem is when you start having kinks, you know, I mean, when you have kinks, you can't advance the instruments and then it's, it's a problem. Uh, so that's hopefully that answers it for you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's one more question from, actually, uh, three questions from Dr. Anurag. First one is, role of cholangoscopy in gallstones in pregnancy. What's your take? Yeah. So, I think it's exciting. I'm, I'm quite impressed. And I saw this um, presentation, this, this study presented at EW two years back. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's, uh, it's a great tool. If you don't want to give radiation, I have not personally tried it. I've not encountered this since the time I've come here, but I would definitely try it in a pregnant patient because it's easy enough. I mean, if you get access to the bile duct and, you know, with cholangioscopy, if you've done it enough, then it should not be an issue uh, uh, as opposed to exposing the pregnant patient to radiation and uh, uh, why, if you can try it and it can be done. And I don't think it should be a real problem accomplishing routine small TBD stones in these patients. Uh, the second question is, is there any role of pancreatoscopy in disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome? Yeah. So as far as disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome goes, which, which you're implying is complete disconnection of the PD and uh, your guide wire is not going across. Interesting thought. The, the issue will be if this patient has a regular pancreatic duct size. Uh, if the PD is, you know, like, 1 mm, 2 mm. See, in these patients, you may have trouble getting the pancreatoscope because the pancreatoscope is 10 French. 10 French is 3.3 millimeters is the diameter. So if you can't get it across to the site of leak, then you can't use it. Maybe if the duct is dilated and you want to get the guide wire across, uh, why not? I mean, I have not come across a case where they've tried it. And I think that's largely because these patients may not have a dilated duct. So that's probably why, but uh, worth a shot, you know. Uh, maybe even future we'll be, we'll try it and see if it works. Okay. Uh, the third question from Dr. Anurag was, any role of cholangoscopy in communicating uh, hydrated cyst? Communicating hydrated cyst? No, I have not tried it. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, this is a new disease for me. I've seen barely a couple of patients since I've come here for hydrated cysts. Uh, you know, I, there's a colloidal cyst, uh, which technically all get surgery, uh, but maybe the, uh, I don't know if there could be a role in that, uh, but I've not tried it. Sorry. I don't know. Yep. Uh, there is one more question, sir. Uh, which subset of patients with pancreatic and biliary neoplasia should be recommended to undergo pancreatoscopy or oblique cholangoscopy? So... If you talk about biliary neoplasia, we are talking about uh, cholangiocarcinomas. 
in these patients, I would say, of course, there's limited data and there's only one study which has showed benefit of use of uh, cholangioscopy. So I would say if you have a cholangiocarcinoma, which is resectable, and you're sending the patient for a surgery, and uh, more importantly, say this is a you know, high-risk surgical candidate, and you are already not sure whether this is resectable or not, you feel it is. So in those patients, if you want to determine the extent and uh, try to know if, you know, if, if it's beyond the resectability, then uh, maybe it can be tried. And 25% patients in that series became unresectable after they did the cholangioscopy. Now, of course, it's not going to tell you vascular involvement, which you need 3D uh, cross-sectional imaging study for. Uh, but of course, work with your surgery colleagues and see if that's something you can do. The one thing you may encounter problem is if you cannot get the cholangioscope across the strictured um, mass. So in that case, you can't know the proximal extent. The distal extent you will know, and uh, the proximal extent you may not. So that could be a challenge you may encounter. So again, bottom line, resectable cholangiocarcinoma patient going for surgery. If you want to use it, worth a shot, uh, limited data. There is uh, only one study as best as I could come up with. And the next is pancreatic neoplasia. I think there's probably a little uh, more role in pancreatic cancer, um, not routine pancreatic cancer, main duct IPMN, because um, in main duct IPMN, that'll determine your surgical resection margin. So you can do intra-op or pre-op pancreatoscopy, determine the, ex uh, the extent of uh, involvement of the main duct IPMN. Now the question is, uh, uh, what, what they may also come up with is a tattoo in future where you should be able to tattoo the distal proximal margin of the IPMN that may help the surgeons resect it effectively. So that could be uh, a possible uh, role. That's, yeah, okay. Uh, there is one more question from Dr. P.K. Sharma on reusability of spy bite. How many times? How many times? You can tell me that. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I just, I, I was, uh, of course, I was uh, spoiled when I was in the West where, uh, you know, I just used spy bites and if they went or they, they, you know, they were not, I could always get more spy bites, bottom line. Here, um, I started using it and a uh, couple of cases I did in, in, with one spy bite so far, it's worked okay. Um, so I don't have that much experience in the Indian context to see if uh, it works more. You guys can comment on it. I don't know from your experience with all the staff in, in India, how many times have they been able to use it? I think uh, three to four though we have seen, sir. Yeah. Provided see, you're I, doing, yeah. Right. So see, the other thing is I would say, personally, yes. If you can use spy bites, it's preferable. Direct, good bites. The new spy bites are pretty good compared. I, I used the earlier ones, say three years back. And I see the new ones. The new ones are, you know, it's more sturdy and robust and they, they work quite well. But uh, I have also used wire guided forceps. Now, if you don't have an exact target and you could, you know, actually biopsy like the entire length of the, say, CBD, then, you know, uh, wire guided forceps can be a viable alternative if the patients can't afford spy bites. All right, next, yeah. If uh, no more questions, uh, so I will request he, Dr. Saurav has already shared his email ID, so you can either directly get in touch with him or you can write it to us and we will pass it on the questions to Dr. Saurav. So uh, thank you, sir. And thanks to all the attendees. I mean, it was a really, really amazing presentation and the variety of cases which we have seen. It's really fantastic, sir. Thank you very much. Until that time, uh, for the next you know, uh, series of Endo Truth, uh, we will join back with you shortly. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you.